Welcome to this fantastic event in the Clark Art Talks series. This is our final event for the quarter. Um, my name is Sensini Stokes and I'm the director of the uh, Archer Gallery and also the Clark Art Talks program. And so this event is kind of a culmination of all of that. Um, and I'm here to welcome two speakers today. Uh, we have Horatio Law, who many of you have had the opportunity to work with in your classes. Um, and various projects and visiting the gallery downstairs at the DACA Lounge exhibition. Uh, Horatio does uh, a lot of community engagement in his artwork. He is um, often tackles weighty subjects with ephemeral and unexpected materials to create a really dynamic uh, immersive experience. So if you haven't seen the show yet, um, it's up through Saturday and it's downstairs in the Archer Gallery and we'll be celebrating that show directly after this talk with a reception from three to four with punch and cookies and you're all invited to come join us there. Um, so we've had a fantastic time having Horatio on campus uh, and he's gonna talk a little bit more about his work today and share that with us. But we've also invited Liliana Luna to join us and share a little bit about her experience. Um, she herself was a DACA recipient and she is the Multicultural Center Coordinator at PCC Rock Creek. Um, she's also a recipient of the 2017 Women of Achievement Award through the Oregon Commission for Women. Um, so Liliana is going to talk a little bit about her work at PCC and also a little bit about her personal experience. We're going to hear from Liliana first and then we'll hear from Horatio. Um, one other thing I wanted to add is that if you guys have not yet seen the Butterfly Sanctuary, it's fantastic. It's over in the Geyser Hall atrium and you'll want to stop by there on your way downstairs for punch and cookies because it's another uh, tied in with Horatio's residency here. Uh, but please join me in welcoming Liliana and Horatio. Hello everybody, how are you? Good? Yes, it's sunny out there. Uh, my name is Liliana Luna and you see me now and that's me when I was little. Um, for me, it's very important to show some pictures. So I'll show you, uh, no, it's not working. oh, there you go. Um, so a little bit, of, like some pictures, right? Like that's my mom and my dad. If I don't use the microphone, is that okay? Or can yeah. I use, yeah. Or, yeah? Okay. Um, that's my mom and my dad and that little thing is me. That's, <laughs> that's when I was little. Um, one of the reasons why I like to show pictures, um, as an immigrant, pictures are very important. never got to take memories with me. Um, so I always left all my, like, you know how people have their toys when they were little, like clothes and whatever, even you know, family pictures. Uh, so I don't have any of that. I only have the pictures that I show, and so for me they're very important. And they really talk about who I am and, and, and the things that I've gone through. And so when I talk about where I come from, I like to give you a picture of how that looks like. For me, um, in Mexico, I grew up super poor. And I'm really proud of that. I'm not, like, I don't want people to feel bad about me or anything. I actually think about it. My dad got to make those, those houses for us. So he's a very creative man, very hardworking man um, that knew that we needed a better life. And while he was very smart at creating those, those houses, he knew that there was something else out there for us. For me, that was my normal. I grew up thinking that all kids live in those kind of houses. And actually, um, while I was putting that presentation together, I remembered that there was this song uh, that my brothers and I used to sing when, uh, when he was raining. Um, because the, 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 the ceilings are made of, um, let me see if I can remember how to calculate the word. Yeah, like, yeah, you see it, right? You don't want to <laughs> Yes. Uh, 
one room in the house. But still, we got gathered together and just kind of, because we got so operated with rain, or the kind of with rain, um, we'll just kind of like follow things like that. Um, so I just want to give you that idea um, of a little bit of where I come from. Ooh, hold on. This thing I'm trying to still figure it out. Okay. So people ask me also some of the questions that I gave, like, well, why did you become active? Why did you speak up about you be about what you believed? And um, especially being undocumented in the United States and talking about being undocumented so openly, especially nowadays, it is kind of dangerous. Um, and I, when I was again, I was putting this this presentation together. I thought. Really, when did everything start, right? And I go back to that time. And um, that's my mom, and those are my little brothers. Um, they're not little anymore. Hector, the middle one, he's uh, 26, 25. So I was um, only three years older than him. And I remember that that's when I, I think I became an activist, um, around the age uh, five. And the reason why I became an activist is because I showed you where we live. Of course, the, the, the resources are very, very limited for us. Um, so my parents didn't really have in mind that they were going to send us to school. And for me, somehow, somewhere, I had heard that if you have a qualification, then your life is different, right? That's what I had heard. I didn't mean, know I was a kid. I was five, six. Um, but I, I wanted, not only for myself, but I wanted my brothers to go to school. And I was, I, was, I was willing to sacrifice sacrifice myself for that. So I remember convincing my mom, like, please take my brother to kindergarten. And she said, no, because we don't have time, we don't have money, I have to work, we don't have to work. And um, until the point that um, my mom called the bus, the three of us to school, and then it started. But I think that that's when I became an activist. When I really thought about, I want a better future, not only for myself. I never thought about myself. I've always thought about my brothers and my community. And so my parents integrated from time to time, right? And like I said, I don't have the community memories of being young, being a kid. Um, anyway, long story short, my parents integrated to know my family that I have to in Texas. And again, like I showed you my normal growing up, and this is my normal in my teenage, teenage um, years. Um, this was my normal. Cars exploding outside of my school, uh, the military always searching our houses, searching us and taking advantage of us, and also like my friends carrying guns around. And I want to make this very clear. Um, that's, that's what's being lived in war. And one of the reasons why is because the drugs, right, coming in and out. And one of the reasons that drugs are in and out of the country is because we want them. Right? So if, we, if, if people want drugs, then Mexico can supply them. And so that, that happened in Malaya. So when we talk about the wall, I don't think about like just the wall. I think about, about what people go through in the border. Militarization of the border, a lot of killings, a lot of oppression raises on in Mexico. Right? So that was my reality. Um, and then my parents said again, let's move. We need a better life. Um, and I was, at that time, I was 14, 15. I was, I was a teenager. I, I had a boyfriend. I was going to school. And of course, I didn't want to move. Plus, I already knew uh, how life was going to be in the United States for me as a woman of color. And I didn't speak the language. Why would I go to another country that I, that I feel like I'm not even wanted there? I don't even speak the language. Then where would we go? But then again, my parents knew better. That they wanted to give me a better life. They wanted to give my brothers a better life. So of course they went after the American dream, right? And so for them, the American dream was having a house or an apartment, whatever that is, having food and working. That's it. That was that was it for them. They wanted me to have an education, um, and that was their their idea of the American dream. What they didn't know, and sometimes I think like they go through things. But they don't really understand much of how the, the, the situation is in the United States. Might be because of the, the lack of either speaking or, um, or, or understanding the language. Um, they think that we, we may, we're here. 
And so I'm going to skip this part. This is a little bit of um, something that I wrote, ooh, something that I wrote um, about me and how I feel in the United States, how I feel in education. The only part that I will, that I will um, uh, read is that part, starting from working hard. Um, so working hard for an education meant dolor, that's pain, uh, hum uh, humiliation, depression, and anxiety. And this is how I feel um, in school right now. I go to uh, Portland State, I'm getting my master's, aside from uh, my work at PCC. And so, um, imagine riding a bike on the freeway where everybody else drives cars. And car drivers assume that everybody else advances and are protected by the benefits of driving in a car. You find yourself feeling smaller, slower, compared to the rest of the car drivers. Imagine getting to your destination physically, mentally, and emotionally exhausted. That's how I feel in school. I feel, uh, me siento más pequeña, I feel smaller, y más lenta, and slower than everybody else. So I say that, um, because I know that we all love different situations, right? Um, and this is how I feel in school, but regardless of how I feel, I know that I have to continue, and I need only for myself. Uh, but for my community. So I'm gonna skip this part. Um, try, okay, so in high school, I was given two options, as the PowerPoint said, either go back to Mexico or come to the, or um, go back to Mexico and come back the legal way, or um, work at a Mexican restaurant, because in a Mexican restaurant, um, they speak Spanish and they can pay you under the table. So imagine me, a 15, 16, asking my counselor, I'm gonna go to school. I mean, think about it, my parents brought me to the United States and we don't have a better teacher. And again, I had this idea that if you go to school, your life is going to be better. So I really wanted to fight for that education now that my parents um, had brought me here. And um, long story short, I ended up at PCC. Um, and I ended up being super involved in student government, uh, the Technical Center, and other leadership programs that serve uh, students of color. And so when I give presentations and I talk about my story, many people ask me, what can I do? How can I support? Because I'm talking about myself and my experience, my family's experience. There's so many undocumented students out there, so many students that need the support, right? So when people ask me that question, I said, to me, that's what an ally looks like. That's what a person that supports you looks like. Now that's that's my mentor, uh, rallying outside of the detention center. I'm not saying that all of you should, <laughs> should go to the detention centers and do rallies, but that picture means a lot to me because for me, that was important to speak up about injustices that were going on. And what she did, instead of just saying, yeah, I support you verbally, she went with me. And that's only one, um, one, uh, one example of many. Now she's my co-worker. Um, she's my co-worker, and we, we work together. And so that's just um, a little bit of the, the things that, that I call the people's rights. So speak up against, um, in Multnomah County, against the sheriffs, and saying, hey, you cannot you cannot uh, train our people to um, detention centers, to immigration detention centers. And that was the first time that I came out of the shadow saying that I was undocumented publicly, like publicly, hundreds of people. Um, and I got arrested at that point. I thought I was gonna get deported. My parents told me many things in Spanish that I should not say, but it's by the words. <laughs> they were 
Thank you, Liliana. Um, so inspiring. Um, so um, my name is Horatio Law. I'm an artist from Portland. And can you hear me OK? Yeah. OK. Um, so I was just going to talk until the screen shows up. Um, I'm uh, a child of immigrant. Uh, came to this country with my parents when I was 16, almost the same age as Liliana. Um, but hearing uh, Liana talk about uh, her experience and life, I feel like I'm such a privileged uh, person. Um, and all of us, I think, you know, feel privileged in many, many ways and can take in uh, our, our life and our rights for granted a lot. So, um, well, the, the title of my show is called Dr. Lounge, uh, Dean Sanctuary. It was uh, actually uh, a title inspired directly by uh, Liliana's Dreamer Center. You didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> and I was uh, given uh, at gallery to do a show in Central Washington State in Ellensburg. Mm -hmm. And I've been working with a series of work for a while now about immigrants and refugees. And um, you know, artists is you know, great when something say, here's a space, do something. Uh, I was very excited, but I also try and look around for something to anchor all the ideas I've been working with for a while. And then when I read about Liliana's uh, Dreamer Center, it just gave me an idea that sort of helped me coalesce 
uh, all the idea I've been working on about migrants and uh, refugees and immigrants. So um, what I'm going to start will be some of my previous work that uh, led me into um, making work about communities. Um, I've been working in public art and installation work, and, uh, and I sort of find myself specialized in working with community. Uh, I work outside the gallery. I, I rarely show in gallery nowadays, but if people invite me to show in galleries, like in this one in the Archer Gallery, I'd be happy to do it. But most of my work is really outside the gallery. I work as a, a public artist where I uh, often uh, get contracted work to create public art. And for those work, I have to work with community uh, to, to come up with the, the artwork itself. It's not working? No, it's not. Oh, here we go. Uh, this is uh, one of the first pieces that I made uh, that is working directly with, uh, with a very diverse uh, Asian community. You know, when we talk about Asian community, most people, we would think of only one type of person. Uh, but inside the, the Asian community, there's a very diverse group of people. Uh, you know, from Japan to China to Korea, Southeast Asia, India, you know, it, the people are very different and very diverse. Um, I was asked to create this piece for a uh, organization in Seattle called Asian Counseling and Referral Service, and they provide uh, social services and legal services for uh, Asian community. And I was asked to uh, create an art piece that sort of show the strength of the community, but at the same time, show the diversity of the community. So I created this piece with uh, these um, large ceramic bowls. They were gilded, uh, glazed with gold on the inside. And they hang in the stairwell between three floors. Um, originally, my design were, I was gonna use this commercially available ceramic bowls, uh, because of the, uh, the budget itself is very tight. However, I couldn't find um, the bowls that sort of fit my image, uh, my idea, what this column would look like. Uh, and then I was talking to my friend Courtney, who's right here, and she said, why don't you just have someone to cast it, custom cast it for you? And I, I thought, oh, that would be so expensive. But I went and talked to this group called uh, Mud, Mud Sharks. They are uh, just starting up, the, they do custom, small batch custom casting. And so they create these uh, uh, basic, very basic ceramic bowls for me. But what it leaves out is the, here we go. So um, what happened is it's all the bowls were not decorated. So I wasn't going to do all 192 bowls because I wasn't paid for doing that much work. <laughs> so I took the opportunity and offered it to the whole community. So everyone in the organization can come in and decorate their own bowls. So I asked them to think about your life experience. A lot of people in that group are immigrants. And so I said, well, bring in um, idea from your own uh, culture, <coughs> textures, patterns. You can do, if you're good at drawing, then do your life experience or immigration and all those things. And we did this um, uh, glazing circle where we come in and uh, I show them how to put the glaze on and then, uh, and then we fire it. Uh, so everyone from staff, volunteer, and client. Uh, and then we uh, document every one of those bow in the book. So I'm really bad at this. Um, 
This is another piece that I've done in Seattle with a neighborhood called South Park. And uh, I was asked by the, well, I got this contractor job to create an art piece above a drain drainage hole. So it's not a glamorous, most glamorous <laughs> work. <laughs> but that, that's a hole. And, and originally, it's just a, a metal cage covering it. And so I'm supposed to make it look better and also create something for the community at the same time. So um, this is the result of it, actually. So uh, uh, this is the original site. So I started out with a very simple uh, paper cut snowflakes. Uh, all of my work started with a very simple thing. Like the last one started with a rice bowl. It's like the bowl is something that all Asian countries really use. In this case, I decided to talk about drainage, uh, meaning talk about water. Um, I decided uh, to think about where the water came from. And mm, most of the water in Seattle came from reservoir. That water also come down from uh, uh, snow, uh, from accumulated snow in mountain. So I decided to start out with this with a <coughs> snowflake. And anyone can cut a paper snowflake. And we all done it in, in school and when we were kids. And but everyone cut their snowflake a little differently. And so what I did was I sandblasted the snowflake pattern onto these uh, glass disc. They have a thin layer of blue on top, and we sandblast the pattern on it, and the blast away the blue, and then you get the white pattern of the snowflake. So this, in a way, sort of, um, you know, we talk about like not one slow snowflake resemble each other. Each snowflake is unique, and I kind of use the analogy for human as well. And then the shape of the sculpture is from looking at this neighborhood and, and uh, talking to the people there and figured out how dynamic this neighborhood is, even though it's one of the poorest neighborhoods in Seattle. But people were, they were artists and there were f people, you know, do manual labor, uh, a lot of blue collar, collar worker. But the community is very active and they're really aware of what's going on and they were actively fighting their own right. So I decided to create this piece that looked like a, a giant vortex or a tornado as a way to show that people can get together and create very powerful change. Another project I did with uh, people is, uh, this is not a public art project, but a, a project that um, I work with uh, an organization called Sisters of the Road in Portland. Sisters of the Road is a homeless uh, organized, uh, homeless service organization. They provide uh, inexpensive meal for anyone uh, who walk in. So you can pay dollar fifty, you can get a full warm meal, and if you can't afford it, you can work for it. And so a lot of homeless uh, uh, people in Portland go there for a, a, a good lunch, and. When I wanted this thing, anyone who is an artist and artist, art student here? Anyone? Okay. So when I opt out of the gallery system, I decided that I don't really need a gallery to do what I want to do. I can go directly to the people because I'm interested in working with people and community. And a gallery is not always going to support that because they can't sell what I'm going to make. Uh, so I decided I'm just going to go directly to people, an organization, and said, hey, I, have, I would love to do this project with you, and I have this idea. Would you be interested in working with me to create this art project? And I have never had anyone say no to me yet. So you know, if you think about an art career, there's many, many possibilities out there. And you, you, as artists, we have to think creatively. And obviously, I think gallery doesn't work for me, but I find something that worked for me really well. So in this case, um, we uh, decided to look at um, history of homelessness. Uh, these are symbols that created by, uh, because in, in the 30s, during the Depression era, um, in the 1930s, lots of people were 
in the in the farm uh, there was the, you know drought and you know a lot of the farmland become dust bowl so then lots of people lost their farm and home and they just uh, traveling around looking for work looking for a place to stay looking for food um, we call them hobos I don't know that term but you you still use that term or understand that term but uh, they call hobos and they what they did was they have this language you can call it secret language language between uh, between them they created symbols that they understand uh, they convey information to each other and they usually done it in a chalk mark outside train station or bus station or places where people can just spot it and if you uh, another hobo you you find those marks and they tell them different information where, whether this is a safe place to camp uh, you know, all this information, but I, I love this one about the cat, so kind-hearted lady. Now you can decide what that means, right? Uh, so there's a lot of these really wonderful sim symbols. Um, and I thought, okay, maybe we can base this and ask uh, this contemporary homeless community to create something that reflect their uh, their homelessness, what they need. That chicken is telephone, so I have no idea what that means. <laughs> but they agree that it's going to be telephone. <laughs> um, so I decided to ask the community says that, well, we can create our own signage, but this signage is about what you need. So most of the homeless people nowadays are uh, urban homeless. So they have their needs that are very different than those hobos in the past. So I create these worksheets and have people to come in and you know, do their own uh, drawing and uh, symbols. And some of the symbols were based on this old, older uh, symbol that I show you, but a lot of them were brand new. And we created uh, over 60 symbols. Uh, this one, uh, all of you probably Transgender. Uh, this one said uh, there's a shelter and a baby food. This one uh, you can get a meal and share a meal together. Um, and then um, we So we turn those um, symbols into decal, and we can fire onto these secondhand plate that we found. And then the community come back and reglaze those plate and decorate it again. So these are the result. The, the decal will fire and go in black. So you can see that this is free shower. This is also very touching, but sharing a cup of coffee together. And we put up a show together, and these plates were mounted on cafeteria trays, and we did it in the mall, actually. It was really fun. Um, also, we uh, create a directory of all the symbols. Um, so, just about three years ago, um, I started hearing and seeing images of Syrian refugees. Um, they were um, Syria experiencing civil war and a lot of political un unsteadiness. Um, the regular people were caught in the crossfire, and a lot of them decided to flee the country to find a safer place to live. A lot of them crossed over in Jordan, to Jordan. Uh, for, uh, into the desert, and then other people f go went further and crossed the Mediterranean Sea to Europe to find a safer place to live. Uh, here are some of the pictures, uh, just heartbreaking.
sorry. <laughs> Here they are, are walking across desert, and then these are, those are the children. Uh, those are the children in refugee camps. Um, so, so the next group of work is, you now this is uh, uh, about DACA, about uh, as Leanna talked about it earlier on, uh, dreamers, um, centuries and war. So one of the things I'm working on is finding something that resonate with the current crisis of migrants and immigrants and uh, refugees. And, um, and as I've been looking at uh, uh, monarch butterflies, which is a species of butterfly that migrates. Um, well, they do it both ways. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, mana butterfly migrates, and they winter in central Mexico, and then when it's getting get, get a little warmer, they will fly to United to what uh, north to first to the United States, and then eventually they were in Canada and even to the Arctic Circle, uh, and then before winter they dis they would fly back to. Uh, central Mexico to winter. However, the butterfly that left Mexico early on are not the same butterfly that returned from the Arctic Circle. They take four or five generations. Uh, so they started in Mexico, they moved north a little bit, they stop, reproduce, the next generation keep moving north, and so on and so forth. So by the fifth or sixth generation, the winter time came, he flew back to Mexico. How did they know how to do that? I don't know. I don't think scientists still don't know it yet. But it, it set up an interesting uh, 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 analogy to also human migration in the sense that um, you know, all of us were descendants of immigrants in the United States. Uh, how often you hear about people, you know, family came from somewhere in Europe and then you know, great, 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 great grandparents or from Europe and then they said, oh, I'm gonna go back to Ireland or where my grandparents came from, and I'm gonna find my wood. And often they get back to get to those places, and and realize some of the things that happening in their family that they thought is peculiar is actually, you know, usual thing in the old country. That they 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 are reenacting, or they are uh, has a custom that really reflect where they came from. Um, so I sort of use that analog analogy of the uh, monarch butterfly migration as uh, human migration. They go through their uh, life cycles. Uh, and I started first folding origami butterfly just, to f just for fun uh, and quickly get bored with it. And then I was in a residency in central Oregon that have us, is located in a place that have been gone through wildfire, uh, forest fire wildfires, and uh, the charred landscape sort of inspired me. So I decided to uh, burn these butterfly, uh, and, and they created really interesting shape and, and um, pattern with them. And I created an installation with these butterflies. Um, and then I started looking at the Syrian refugees crisis, and I started seeing a lot of children's face showing up um, in, in, on the internet. And uh, so a lot of time I see a family and I will zoom in on the children's face and I will uh, take the images out and put it on color pictures, uh, color paper, and I fold them in the origami butterflies. Uh, here are the process that I go through. It started from an image, get that photo into a regular origami butterfly and then I and burn it and charge it and uh, singe it. And then you, if you open the paper again, you see how much damage is done to the face. So 
So in a way, I'm trying to think about um, all these children that were traveling with their parents. They could be um, you know, walking in the desert with them, or they'd be floating on a rubber raft with them in the open sea. How um, all the trauma they go through that we don't see, you really don't see it. And, um, and so this is the first piece you're gonna see downstairs uh, in the gallery. Uh, each one of these butterflies were folded from the image of the, the, the children that they represented. At the entrance, you see these uh, two wall units. And they are sort of inspired by the idea of uh, the, the long history of wall building effort yeah, all over the world. This is the Great Wall of China. It was uh, a whole bunch of smaller length of wall owned by, uh, built by different kingdoms. They were eventually united by one emperor and he decided to connect them all and form this Great Wall of China. And it's a vanity project in that, that really, you know, you can, you can go around this wall, really, if you try. Um, but every single empire had tried to build a wall, and every one of them failed. And the idea of, uh, of a wall is, is really fertility, uh, fertile effort to try to use it as an idea to protect your own country. Um, so uh, this is the way I build my wall. I create a pattern uh, based on uh, the Buddhist uh, monastery that I've seen in the back. Often they have these rows and rows of golden Buddha. And then I see in the cathedral in Europe and look up in the ceiling and see all these ghost stars. Uh, so they become the source of my inspiration in building these walls. So if you go downstairs, you will see um, inside the gallery is a group of uh, inflatable couches that you encourage to lie down in them and relax. The one end of the, the gallery is projected this uh, uh, constellation map. And that has evolved. Originally, it was just a projection. And then uh, I collaborate with uh, one of your teacher here, Damien, uh, Damien Gilly, uh, 2D design class, and they uh, put a gemstone into each of the stars. So you go down and see it, you can actually see the gemstone kind of twinkling. Here they are putting the, the gemstone in. That's the whole class. And uh, peeking through the walls, you can see the inflatable couch, they light up. And uh, you can lie down and relax. There's um, a sound attached to it. Uh, it's actually operated by motion sensor. So if you're moving along, around a lot, the sound will, will turn off. And you stay still for 30 seconds, the sound will return. And these are all nature sounds like birds, call, uh, cricket, frogs, um, owls, and um, you can lie there and you can relax, you can um, contemplate, uh, you can look at the stars, and imagine you're floating on a rubber raft uh, in the dark. Um, one, one of my impetus for creating this uh, installation is, is kind of selfish. Um, as an artist, and we are sensitive toward things happening around us. And I found myself waking up every morning dread, dreading the news, like what else is happening now? What, what horrible things gonna disturb me the rest of my day? And it's happening over and over again. So the idea of creating a sanctuary for me <laughs> initially um, is to create a, uh, a quiet spot where I can be 
dreaming, I can dream, I can think creatively, I can relax, I can um, meditate. Um, and I also talking to Liliana, she mentioned about uh, self-care and as artists and you know, activists as well, we understand that we need to rejuvenate ourselves, we need to take care of ourselves and, you know, and so that we can go on and do the, the activist work. And so this is in a way dedicated to uh, the activists uh, that are fighting the good cause. And so, um, so I invite you all to go downstairs and enjoy it. Um, probably also better to come back later when there's less people in there because it's a place where uh, you can relax and contemplate. Uh, so I'm gonna stop here and take questions. Yes. What is DACA? DACA is the acronym for Defer Action for Childhood Arrival. It's a program, um, it's a stopgap program set up by President Obama. And because Congress was unable to enact the DREAM Act, which will give a path for um, undocumented uh, young people uh, who came with their parents, uh, not at their own will, uh, and allow them to have a legal way to become a citizen. Uh, you know, think about anyone, whether uh, your, your parents uh, can be documented, undocumented, if you were born in this country, let's say your parents, your mother is pregnant and came to this country and you were born in this country, uh, you're automatically an American citizen. But if you came with your parents when you're a month old or even a few weeks old, you are not. So what is the difference there, right? Um, so, so that's the DACA. Anybody else? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I wasn't an art student. I was a student studying science. I was a, a pre-med major. I studied biology in college. And uh, I never thought about art back then. Uh, it wasn't an option. Uh, uh, you know, immigrant children don't have the luxury to think about art. And their parents expect you to become some kind of professional which doesn't include an artist. Uh, but when I was in college, uh, I was trying really hard. I, I studied hard, but after about two and a half years, I just crumbled. <laughs> I started doing really poorly. Uh, I realized I was not that interested in the subject. I wasn't passionate about it. But after college, I started working for a university. Um, the, and uh, I was you know, one of the tr cheap trail uh, actually, it's not cheap. Uh, one of those thrills of working for a university is they get free tuition. So I was working for Columbia University, and I get to take seven credits per semester. It's almost a half-time kind of thing for free. So I just took the opportunity and started taking all kind of courses. And one of those courses was a painting class. And then once I took that class, it's like uh, another door opened, and I realized I like this, <laughs> uh, but I still didn't know what else to do with it. So I just continued uh, taking a lot of art classes and eventually I went back to school, get my BFA, and then still don't know what to do with it. And it took a few more years. Uh, my friend Steve Karakashian can attest to it. Uh, when he knew the moment that I decided to go to art school um, uh, in, in terms of, uh, uh, I think, a master program, MFA program. And uh, I have to go through a lot of work to get there, but his great help. Thank you. I'm going to go walk. This is in New York. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, I would invite you to go downstairs, have some cookies and juice, right? And. Uh, <laughs> And I'd be around, you want to ask me a question personally, that's fine too.